Welcome to The Filibuster, the podcast of the Union University Political Science Department. The filibuster refers to the right to unlimited debate. But unlike the Senate filibuster, we're going to keep ourselves limited today. Our goal is to reflect the best traditions of the world's greatest deliberative body by being a form of civil discussion with our academic, political, and Christian perspectives. I'm Seth Brake, and I'm a visiting professor of political science at Union, and I'm joined today by Hunter Baker, the Dean of Arts and Sciences and Professor of Political Science, and Sean Evans, the Department Chair and Professor of Political Science. And today we're going to be discussing the politics of abortion in a post-Dobbs world. So thank you guys both for being here. Thank you for having us. So I guess before we get into some of the more technical questions about this, let's just start general. Um, why is abortion such an animating factor in political life? Uh, I would say that the United States is the kind of nation that values autonomy very highly, right? We are, we are sex, drugs, and rock and roll, capitalism, uh, you know, uh, the entertainment industry, all of those things. And um, a nation of that type is going to value uh, the right to do something like end a pregnancy. Uh, it's going to value the kind of actions that preserve an individual's autonomy at almost any cost. Uh, and so that's... That's a right that many Americans have come to value very highly. Um, some have shown even during times when it was illegal that they would avail themselves of it. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, if, if, there, if we're defining this discussion as kind of about the struggle to, uh, to regulate abortion or to, or to put it out of, out of uh, legal sanction, uh, it's going to be it's going to take a long time. It's going to be a big fight. Hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to disagree with that. I think the idea of personal autonomy is huge. I, I think part, part, of, part of that, though, is also that life is important. And so on the contrary side, the idea is if personal autonomy is important, then the unborn also has a right to make decisions about itself and not have some, someone treat uh, the unborn as something that is less than human. And so we truly have conflicting ideas about freedom versus the sanct the sanctity of life. And these are things that people feel very passionately about and understandably so. It seems like the conversation around these things is a little different now, though. Has, has this changed after Dobbs? I think it's changed because it has become much less of an academic conversation. Um, in the past, the, the right to an abortion was basically uh, enshrined behind a wall put up by the Supreme Court uh, in Roe v. Wade, uh, essentially saying that the states, regardless of their having the police power, um, simply were not able to prohibit abortion, full stop, you know, that, that they would have to allow uh, some degree of abortion services. And uh, so really, I think that people thought that in fighting to reverse Roe, what we were talking about was ending abortion. And what mm -hmm. we were really talking about was the right to submit the issue to democratic consideration. And so, uh, you know, we're really only at the beginning. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, I, and, and I, think, I think people view it in a much different, different way because of that. So, for example, polling has shown that before Dobbs, pro-life meant abortion with restrictions. That's how people saw that. Post-Dobbs, people view pro-life as an absolute ban. And so because Dobbs has changed the way people view those terms, that has actually moved po the political advantage toward those who support abortion. Interesting. So that legal framework changing actually changed the, what the terms we used to describe it. Yes. Mean. Yes. So this issue becomes very heavily intertwined with questions of faith and Christianity and public life and things like that. Um, as Christians, how should we think about this issue and approach it? How does that change the, the discussion? Well, I would just say in my own case, uh, I can remember being in high school and hearing a debate about abortion and... Um, uh, my conscience was fairly hard on the issue. You know, basically, I just thought if a woman wants an abortion, she can have an abortion. Uh, I, I wasn't really that interested in it, didn't care about it. And, and um, strangely, after I converted to Christianity um, in college at Florida State University, I found that I began to think differently about the issue. Um, 
not only because I began to be around people who cared about the issue, but also I just started to kind of consider the idea um, that God knows each one of us, uh, that, uh, that, that each one of us possesses um, an inherent dignity of being made in the image of the Creator. And when I began to think about it that way, uh, it put an entirely different face on the issue for me. Um, and, and over time became a fairly urgent issue for me. Yeah, uh, I, I would agree with what Hunter says on this. Uh, I, I'm kind of the political institutionalist, uh, the process person. So I, I think also that um, this, when you have a position that is unpopular with the nation at large, that's going to affect how you view this and the kind of strategies that you might pursue. Uh, because when you can actually ban abortion and people realize that, you have to some sometimes think, okay, if I do this, it's for the good of the unborn, but do I do something that can potentially make this a pyrrhic victory, which leads more people to move to the other side. So I, I think this is really one of those issues of statesmanship to where you're trying to find a way to how you can advance your position in a way that you can uh, persuade others who are undecided on this to try to move them to the position that you want. Um, and in the culture that we live in, I think that's a very difficult challenge that we face. Your, your point about strategy is, a, is an important one. Um, I can remember being a lobbyist in the Georgia legislature. And uh, I can remember we had, uh, we had some kind of an abortion bill that we were pressing at that time. And the Georgia Right to Life people announced that they would no longer consider it a pro-life position to say that, uh, that one was against abortion except in the cases of rape or incest. Mm. Uh, that they would begin to score that, even that, right, uh, as a pro-choice position. And, I, and, and, of course, uh, in principle and philosophically, I can completely understand that. But thinking politically... Yeah. It seems spectacularly unwise. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I I understand the the point as yeah. you do, but I think part of we things we have to do is that politics is about addition. You want to grow the size of your support, and I think too often we see people on on all sides. It's not just a abortion to where we try. <clears throat> to define a issue in such a way as to where we start to take away the support front from us by saying it's this or nothing else. So what political incentives would lead a group to want to narrow their coalition like that? I mean, what's the, what's the strategy there? Well, I think that, um, I think that probably is, is similar in some ways to the argument about civil rights in a previous era, right? Or, or mm -hmm. slavery. Um, you, you have an issue that you conceive of as being an issue that is really a justice issue, right? right? A fundamental right. justice issue. And then when you talk about, you know, moderating that position or incremental steps, then it's like you don't care about right. justice, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, I mean, and, and, and here's the thing. I mean, we're talking about strategy here. For a lot of people, there's nothing to strategize about. If you believe that the unborn is life, it doesn't matter if it is rape or incest, it is still a life worth protecting. So I, I think the thing we have to realize is these people are making these points out of sincere conviction. Hmm. Well, and I guess that gets to the thornier side of this, because if you are, if you, if your conviction is that every abortion is a murder, right? Like that, that's the most fundamental justice issue you can imagine. How can you morally consider compromising on that? Even if you can make a compelling strategic case for it, how can you even stomach that? Yeah, and I, I want to address that issue. So um, I've expressed that I have a very strong, you know, pro-life position. I have tended, and I'm not, I'm not just talking about strategy here. I'm also talking about human feeling. Mm -hmm. I have tended to try to avoid the use of the word murder, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the uh, I prefer to say... Um, that abortion represents the unjust taking of an innocent life. Um, and, and part of the reason that you do that is, is the same reason that when we legislate against abortion, we often aim that legislation against the physician 
who would be carrying out the procedure because we recognize that the mother of the child is in particular potentially an emotionally distressed position um maybe maybe may not be making the most reasonable judgment uh about about the situation maybe under duress um and so for that reason it sometimes it's helpful to avoid the more charged mm-hmm. language mm-hmm. Uh, with regard to the issue but i think what you just described there it's not just avoiding the charged language, which it is, but it's also changing the way that the laws we advocate for would function, right? If I understand correctly, how would you respond to the critique that that doing that compromises a basic issue of justice? Yeah, well, it goes to that. It goes to that uh, situation that I'm describing. In that the the woman who is pregnant, um, she may be facing a number of crises. They could be economic. They could be relational. Her family could be pressuring her to terminate the pregnancy. Her boyfriend could be pressuring her, even a husband. Um, she may even be under threat from various persons. Um, and, of course, she, or she may even just be thinking that she is, uh, has no idea how she would provide for the child after the child is born. Um, you know, we could come up with a number of, of different circumstances. Um, and so that's why uh, we typically have, have looked mm-hmm. toward the professional Mm-hmm. who's involved in the procedure because they're not really affected by any of those things, right? They're, they're in a much different position, and so it seems to make sense to, to go after them from a regulatory perspective. Mm. No, that makes sense. The, the other side of this question on the issue of you know, proportion and politics that I think um, can, can, can complicate it is the, the way that the moral calculus on the part of, of – people thinking through these compromises can, can overwhelm other issues. You know, I think about if, you know, we, let, let's imagine the sincere pro-life voter, right? How can you, how could you in good conscience compromise that, however you frame that conviction for another issue, right? Like once you think the stakes are that high, doesn't it start to wash out other political issues? Like how should we think through that? I, I think that, I think that that is true. I think that, um, so just as a, as a very contemporary example, um, I think that there probably were very many uh, pro-life voters, Catholic and evangelical, for whom that would have been a predominant issue, um, who may have had reservations about Donald Trump Mm -hmm. from a variety of angles. You know, the fact that he had owned casinos or or, you know, or 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 been married three times or, you know, whatever, whatever you want to come up with, you know, his his demeanor, any number of things. but they thought to themselves, this issue is so compelling that, that I have to vote for him if he's the pro-life option, right? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, you know, and what he was willing to do that somebody like Rudy Giuliani um, in 2008 was not willing to do was he was willing to declare himself for the pro-life cause. Even if it didn't seem like a great fit, he was willing to, to basically make that commitment. And I think that he moved a tremendous number of voters through that choice. I don't think he would have been elected president had he not done that. No, that makes sense. Yeah, uh, to, to a certain extent, I think uh, no matter how you feel, you still want to achieve success. And so I, when, when I look at this, I kind of think a little bit about the Buckley rule, uh, named after Will, William F. Buckley. He, he said, is support the most conservative person who can win. And I think part of what you have to look at this in pro-life things is you have to think about who's the most pro-life candidate who can win, uh, you have, have to consider, or what's the most pro-life cause that can pass. Um, the, these are the kinds of things you have to lo- look at because you don't want to win the battle but lose the war. Mm-hmm. You want to make sure that you're winning enough battles so that you also win the war. That's right. And I, I think also this, so speaking of strategy, I think that this was part of the reason for pro-lifers to focus on partial birth abortion. Right. Yes. Maybe yes. in the late 90s. Right. Of because, course. Because that was that was the kind of thing where even if nothing else would would sort of prick the conscience of people that did. Yes. Right. So it's that sort of thing. Yeah. I mean, and, and the thing is, they were able to pass that at a national level. So it had that kind of bill. But yeah, I, I think that's exactly what the pro-life movement was successful post Roe is that they would talk about 
parental notification, informed consent, 24-hour waiting periods, um, medical safety of the clinics, in which case they were able to make an argument which had a wide range of appeal to people, even those, because we remember, there's people who feel strongly for and people feel strongly against, but most people are kind of in that icky thing. We don't like it, but we kind of like the idea of it being there, but we don't want people to use it. And so if you can put those restrictions on that, those were very popular items. And I think allowed the pro-life movement to have conversations with other people about why we think this is important to potentially grow their numbers. Yeah. And speaking along those lines, um, when I was in Georgia, one of the bills that we were able to pass was called A Woman's Right to Know. Yeah. Um, Which, if I recall the details, uh, you know, we wanted a waiting period Mm -hmm. prior to the abortion um, for certain information to be given to the woman about the abortion procedure, about the the unborn child's development, and maybe it may have even included an ultrasound. Those Uh, were more recent, uh, I I, I think. We may have been been seeking that. I can't remember if we got that, Um, but but we were able to pass a bill of that type. Right. Yeah. Well, and and, and I don't even say that. There there have been a lot of these crisis pregnancy centers that do a lot of these things to to try to uh, convince mothers about there are other options. Uh, uh, options will help you with this. And uh, I, I know a lot of these crisis pregnancy centers have received a lot of attacks, but if you actually pay attention to what they are doing, they are doing the kinds of things that I think anyone would say, here's what we should do. That, I mean, because, uh, for example, we have Birth Choice, Agape, and, and others in this area. Er- area. And what they do is they find out the circumstance in which the woman is in. And if they feel threat from someone, they'll find housing for them. They'll provide medical care for them. They'll provide job training. And the thing is, uh, e- even if they put the child up for adoption or something, they will work through that, but they don't stop at birth. They continue that relationship a- a- after that to make sure that woman is in a better position uh, to, to live her life, but also to make sure she's not in those circumstances again. And so I I think it'd be hard to say if you actually knew what these centers do, that these are not the things that we would not want people to do in these types of situations. That's right. And I mean, well, if you think about it, even if you were pro-choice, I think you should be in favor of these kinds of things, right? You, you, You really don't want somebody to go through what is by and large an unnatural act of killing their own offspring, uh, if there's any way around that, right? And so, so the idea of a pregnancy center that enables somebody to avoid that situation, if at all possible, should be seen as just kind of a general positive. Yeah, and and I would even say if we're thinking about how we could potentially work with uh, people who are not pro-life, I think part of this idea is okay. Can, can we try to come up with these kinds of things? I, I know the left is not going to support the prep pregnancy crisis centers, but can we come up with the idea, okay, can we streamline the adoption process? Can we provide tax credits uh, for the adoption process? I think there are some things to where we we can say, hey, here's some things that we can work together on. And I think that's also important, not just from a pro-life perspective, but from a Christian perspective, because I think part of this also is we need to remember that the people who disagree with this on us. They're still humans. They're still to be respected. Um, And by engaging these type of conversations, working with them, I think that A, convinces them that maybe we're not the kinds of people that they think we are. Uh, And two, it also allows us that chance to have conversations with them um, and potentially bring them around to positions that we support. Is the reason that's difficult because we perceive that these things I mean, well, they are in some ways a zero-sum game in that um, are, they, are they worried that accepting these, these types of, of things like the crisis pregnancy centers or the common sense regulations that seem very reasonable, right, that they, that they think that those things would be um, a step toward losing the, the issue? I mean, <laughs> that, is, that, is, that's the yeah. nature of American politics. Right. Yeah, I mean, we, we do, uh, you know, we have reached a point where where each party is sort of identified mm-hmm. with one of those two positions, 
right? right? Um, and so, so typically you do not want to allow your adversary to win. Right. Um, not, only, not only will winning um, sort of uh, embolden their constituency, um, but it will also make them appear to be more effective. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of downsides to your opponents winning on an issue, and, th- right. and this is one of those issues, uh, I would say regrettably, that has sorted itself on party lines yeah. um, in a way that it didn't have to be. Um, but now you, you have these kind of investments that make compromise very difficult. Now, all of these, all of these things we've talked about, these strategies, these approaches, these were things that were developed under the context of Roe, right? But now we're in the Dobbs era. So how, how has any of this conversation changed? Have the issues changed? Have the tactics changed? Like, what's, what's different now? I, I mean, it's, it's different because now uh, this is a live issue, right? I mean, yeah. it, it, is, it is no longer about the Supreme Court. It's about actual on-the-ground public policy. Um, not not what is possible, but but what could actually happen in any given election, you know, at any given point. And uh, so you could be living in a state that uh, that allows access to abortion that turns around and does not. Right. Uh, and so that makes it super real. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, and actually, I think it helps Democrats because uh, and they've been working on this for a number of years. But because uh, for a long time, probably their best voting block but worst participating voting block was unmarried women. And I think that they've been working very hard to kind of get that block voting. And this issue, like none other, is designed to get unmarried women into the voting booth. Yeah, and I think the right has uh, not done as well on a political basis. It seems to me that... They were more focused on a legal strategy over the past few de- de- decades and not on the political side. Though I think there's also the idea from the Republican Party perspective, I think there are quite a few people in the G- GOP who saw abortion as a way to get voters, but they didn't really believe in the idea itself. And so they they could do like the restrictions because they, they're thinking, okay, I'm fine with this. This is a popular issue. But I think now you see today with this uh, being a live issue, there are more people in the GOP who are pushing back again against this and saying, this is, a kind, this is the kind of issue that we need to drop if we want to be successful because the G- GOP has been struggling uh, at the ballot box really for decades. I mean, they've lost seven out of the last eight popular votes for president um, and not everyone realizes that but there are people who re- realize that and there there's a large percentage of people who want to say this is the reason why we need to drop the pro-life issue or moderate on it yeah there's going to be tremendous pressure there's going to be a lot of people saying this is an election loser yeah um you know you're, there's going to be a lot of people saying uh you know maybe maybe the most ambitious thing you would ever do is say a 15 week limit you know or something yeah. like that so that's going to be the nature of the discussion um I, I think that christians need to treat it exactly the same way that that you know say martin luther king jr did which is to uh to as far as the basic issue goes to resist moderation, right? I I think that they should keep their ambitions high in terms of what should happen. Should they be willing to make deals along the way? Yes, but they, but they should not alter their fundamental position, which is, is that, uh, that we need to preserve the sanctity of life. We need to develop a culture in which we ultimately, um, make abortion, uh, not only illegal, but unthinkable, um, but there's going to be it's going to be t- tough to advance that position for the next several years. Yeah, that seems like a very difficult tightrope to <clears throat> resisting moderation, but also being willing to, may, you know, have those conversations right. and to make that policy. Yeah. Well, as much as I want to get into that, uh, the more strategy and partisan side of this discussion, I think maybe we need to push that into the next part and have a break here. Um, so thank you guys for your thoughts on this. And we, there will be a, a second edition of this where we will finish this conversation. But I want to thank you guys for your, for your input. And so I yield back the balance of my time. <laughs>